It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Christopher Shade, PhD. He's going to be discussing glutathione as a mediator in disease toxicity and inflammation. Dr. Shade earned a PhD from the University of Illinois, where he studied the environmental and analytical chemistries of mercury, as well as advanced aquatic chemistry. During his PhD work, Dr. Shade patented. Can you hear me now? Sure. Thanks for coming back to part two. We're a quieter house this time. Uh, we're going to go in and talk. Uh, I talked in the first half about how the glutathione system works and how it gets deranged and the different problems that people run into and, and what that looks like uh, in the face of mercury toxicity, mercury toxicity that you have now, or how it might have been a toxicity that happened a long time ago, whether when you were in utero or even before that, something that might happen to your mother. And so we talked about the glutathione system as the core of what protects you against metals like mercury, cadmium, and arsenic, but also uh, a number of different pesticides and herbicides. Uh, and one thing that will come up in this talk a couple times is mold toxins. Uh, mold toxins, a lot of people, if you're treating mercury toxic people, you'll see that they are mercury toxic and mold toxic, especially if you're from a moldy area. And uh, we'll see that one of the things that mold toxins do uh, is block some of the defense systems in your body. And so we talked about those defense systems in the part one. Now in part two, uh, we'll talk about testing and detoxification. All right, so I missed one slide I want to throw in there, but you, you, all, you all know elemental mercury as that metal that you're so fond of in dental school. And, uh, we're, and then methyl mercury is the form of mercury in fish. And inorganic mercury is a breakdown product. Uh, it's oxidation of elemental mercury to inorganic mercury, demethylation of methyl mercury to inorganic mercury, and for ethyl, ethyl mercury, which is the vaccine preservative, uh, thimerosal, it's a deethylation that produces inorganic mercury. So each of these has a different toxicity. Uh, elemental mercury, the mercury vapor itself is not really all that toxic. There's not much that it does as elemental mercury, but the elemental mercury is how it gets in. So there's transport forms, forms that get into the body, and then there's what they end up as in the body and end up being toxic as. So the toxic agent, the most toxic agent in the body, is the inorganic mercury. So for mercury vapor, the elemental, uh, the inherent toxicity is low, but when it's when it breaks down to inorganic mercury, it's got a high toxicity. Methyl mercury has an inherent toxicity that's moderate. I mean, these are relative terms. It's moderate, and it's becoming demethylated to inorganic mercury and becoming more toxic. Ethyl mercury is moderately toxic and becomes more toxic as inorganic mercury. Now both of these are pretty darn toxic, but just uh, inorganic mercury is not often, it's not always thought of as being the most toxic because people talk about uh, feeding studies. If you feed that to somebody, they don't absorb it. So it doesn't seem to exert much toxicity, except that, as I said in the first talk, it breaks down the lining of your GI tract, and that sets you up for other problems. Uh, but to a cell, inorganic mercury is the most toxic form because it's the most disruptive to the cellular chemistry. So how fast do these reactions take place? Elemental mercury turns to inorganic mercury very fast. 
In most cases, it's taught that once it absorbs into your bloodstream, it passes once or twice through the body before finding a reaction with the enzyme catalase and being turned into inorganic mercury. Methylmercury to inorganic mercury is very slow and very variable. When we talk about testing, and we talk about speciation testing where we look at methylmercury versus inorganic mercury, we see that some people when they eat fish-based methylmercury turn it into inorganic mercury very quickly and some people do that very slowly. If they do it very quickly, then it's eating fish is more hazardous for them than if they do it slowly. And it's not known why some people demethylate quicker than others, but they do. It's thought to be an oxidative stress situation, but we're not entirely sure. Uh, for instance, in a study that was done on bald eagles, a lot of this information comes from environmental data. Why environmental data? Because people get money to study mercury in the environment, but they don't get money to study it in people. Why is that? Well, there's probably some obvious political reasons for that, but right now the research is being done in environmental. And when they looked at bald eagles, they're all eating fish, and they all have a lot of total mercury in their system. And when they looked in the brains of the bald eagles, they all had a lot of total mercury, which was mostly methylmercury, but some were forming a lot of inorganic mercury. Some were demethylating that methylmercury to inorganic mercury. And the ones who were had the most neurotoxic lesions. And where were the neurotoxic lesions? You remember in the first lecture we talked about the NMDA receptor, which is the glutamate receptor? These lesions were associated with the glutamate receptors, NMDA receptors, meaning you had high anxiety in these birds. And with the NMDA, remember I also told you when you increase glutamate in a aging cell and its antioxidant defenses are low, it suffers damage more quickly. So you go into a neuroinflammatory state very easily. So among people that eat fish, those who demethylate quickly are more likely to have neurotoxic symptoms than those who do not. Ethyl mercury from the vaccines deethylates very, very quickly. Obviously, it was a good thing getting those out of most of the child vaccines. They're still in the flu vaccines, though. And that's really another story. Andy Wakefield can talk more about ethyl mercury. Uh, pathways out. Remember I said methyl mercury is going to the uh, liver and the GI tract. Inorganic mercury is split between this liver GI and the kidney. So we're getting into talking about testing. I just wanted to frame out what the main forms we're going to look at are. And the main forms we're going to look at are the methyl mercury and the inorganic mercury. All things eventually become inorganic mercury, but the movement from methyl to inorganic is slow. And so the two main forms that we find in the body are the methyl and the inorganic mercury. So testing for mercury is set up uh, in what are called ambient measures and provoked measures. Ambient measures, ambient meaning we come over and I say, hey, Steve Hubert, I'm going to draw your blood. I'm going to give you a little cup and you're going to go pee in it. I'm not going to give you anything first. We're just going to test you as is. That's blood, hair, urine, and stool. Each of these has different forms of mercury in it and uh, has you know, different information it can give you. Provoked measures are by and large provoked urine. There are some provoked stool measures, but mostly it's provoked urine. So what is the provocation? The provocation is to give a chelator, a water-soluble chelator like DMSA or DMPS that will solubilize some of that mercury and get it to go, more of it to go out the, through the urine than usually goes out. So in ambient measures, we have blood which has methyl and inorganic mercury in it, of which given roughly equal body burdens of both, methyl mercury will be a much larger number. This is due to how the mercury distributes between the tissues and the fluids, the fluid here being blood. There will always be more in the tissues than in the blood, 
there is a distribution between the two. But for inorganic mercury, it's more tightly skewed towards the tissues. So even if you had equal amounts in your body and we measured your blood, the methyl in your blood might be 10 or 15 times higher than the inorganic. Which means we have to separate the two and look at them individually. If we look at it all together, it's really a measure of the methylmercury. But if we separate it, there's a lot of information. So blood has methyl and inorganic mercury. Hair is only methylmercury. It only reflects what you eat in terms of fish. Urine is almost all inorganic mercury. And uh, some of this is derived from breakdown of methylmercury and some of it if you have amalgams, is coming directly from elemental mercury becoming inorganic mercury. Stool is both methyl and inorganic mercury as well. Uh, to cut to the chase, we don't use stool as much. Stool is a useful measure, but it doesn't fit too well into the panel that we do most often. And people don't like to do stool tests unless they're really sick. So now a provoked measure. Now we went from urine being only inorganic to urine being both methyl and inorganic because the methylmercury now has been made more soluble to the kidneys by complexation with the MSA or DMPS. Now we're going to examine challenge tests and the, some of the benefits and some of the you know, drawbacks of challenge tests, but mostly some of the mythologies around challenge tests. And one of the things uh, that happens with challenge tests is DMSA and DMPS bias differently. DMSA biases towards methylmercury and is very weak on inorganic mercury. So you'll look like you have a more methylmercury relative, relative to inorganic mercury if you are able to speciate the urine. DMPS biases towards inorganic mercury. It's more powerful on the inorganic mercury, so you get more of that flush coming out. Uh, back to testing. We, when, when we do testing, we do non-provoked testing. And we do things that you know, 15, 20 years ago would be considered the wrong thing to do, like a blood test. So there used to be this dictum that blood is only recent exposure. People have heard that before? Blood is only the last two, three days. Well, I don't really, well, I do know where, I'm going to explain where that came from. The reality isn't that. There is a two to three day, sorry. Got to get this thing wrapped around my ear right. Uh, there's a two to three day residence time where you have a peak of mercury in the blood following, say, eating fish. And after that third day, you're at a new baseline and it takes a long, long time to get back to your original baseline. And we'll look in a little bit deeper at that is. So there's a steady state developed after your two to three day, uh, two to three day peak. The real problem is that we just didn't have analytical tools to look at it. As we move forward over the decades, our analytical tools get better and better and better and we can look more and more deeply into things. In graduate school, I developed technology for separating different forms of mercury and so not only did we have to do that very precisely, we had to look down not in the parts per billion, not in the parts per million, not even parts per trillion. I had to be able to see in the part per quadrillion range. And and so, as I said, all the money was going into environmental mercury research, and that's where I'm bringing stuff, from, technology from that side back over into clinical. And so the problem before is that we really didn't have the tools to look at the information, the biological information that's in the ambient samples. So this is to show you kind of where that two to three day residence time came from. Uh, this was a guy who worked for me, and this, was bef this is his blood methylmercury before eating tuna fish, and it was about 0.37, and he eats two cans of tuna, and you see it shoot up, you know, like a little over doubles in two hours. It's about six-fold later in 24 hours, and then after two, three days, it's about down here. And Really, that used to be about the detection limit for most labs. The detection limit is the limit below which you can't see. 
And the mistake everybody makes is to call below the detection zero. So if I was detecting height, I had a pair of eyes here that's a height detector, and that's my limit of detection, I'm only going to see people that are above five foot five. Nobody below five foot five is going to exist anymore. So I might know there's somebody there, I list them as below five five. Doesn't mean they're not there, they're just below my limit. So we want to lower our limits of detection so that we can see everything. So that used to be the limit of detection, so you only see stuff above that line. So here is the profile of peaking. Peaking is about 12 hours after consumption. So it goes up and it comes down. So that's the real profile. But because that's your detection limit, that's all you see. So there's no mercury in the blood. Yes, there is. You just can't see it. Now there's mercury in the blood. Now there's not mercury in the blood. And really, a lot of people in science knew that this is the case, but for some reason it moved into clinical, the clinical tribal knowledge that there was this two to three day uh, residence time. And in fact, here is the, these are profiles of some graduate students eating fish and these are hours and these are peaks in red blood cells, whole blood and plasma. And you see these steep peaks and decays. And so we knew that. And when did we knew that? 1980. So why this perpetuated in clinical medicine for so long, I don't know. So once, if we go back a second, so after, this is before and this is about three days later. So you're at your new baseline. Uh, say, say you go from here to here. How long does it take to get back down to here? What units are those? Uh, these, those are nanograms per mil. This is a really, really high level fish. So how long did it take to get back down the baseline? That's in days, 160 days. So is mercury in the blood for two to three days? No. It takes much, much longer. And the half-life, typically, I showed the half-lives in the Iraq study. The half-life is somewhere from 40 to 70 days, depending on which population you're looking at. And that's for methylmercury and inorganic mercury. And it's really, really, really well documented. I have a video somewhere online where I'm taking quotes out of the National Resource Council, uh, Institute of Medicine, just really mainstream groups. And this has been known for a long time. But we got into using challenge tests and so we built a sort of mythology around the challenge test based on blood can't work and urine can't work. And what do we also say about urine? There's no mercury in the urine until you challenge it. No, there's always mercury in the urine. It was just below detection limits. So the challenge was a way to bring the levels up to where we can see them and put them on a relative scale. Uh, I also, if you stop by uh, Sharon Lynn's Mountain State Health Products in the exhibit area, there's a couple of white papers there that I wrote about challenge tests. And I go through a number of examples in the literature where they showed that the challenge really just brings up the ambient signal. And whatever the challenge is, is proportionate, the challenge number is proportionate to the ambient number. As long as the kidneys are working. So this was one that was done out of Sweden and they were looking at a DMPS uh, challenge across varying exposure to elemental mercury and they took mercury industrial workers with ridiculously high exposure. They took dentists, so it was very high short-term exposure for industry. It was, sh it was lower chronic long-term exposure for dentists and then you had regular people with amalgams and amalgam-free reference. And and you see that there's this uh, linear relationship between urinary mercury before provocation and plasma mercury. Plasma was a quick way for them to do speciation because most of the methyl mercury is on the red blood cell. So plasma gave them a quick cut at inorganic. So inorganic in the plasma up as urinary mercury goes up. And then they gave them a DMPS challenge. And the theory was that the long-term exposure of the dentists, if the DMPS 
challenge told you something about the lifetime of exposure more than the current exposure that those would merge together and the 30 the dentist had been in operation 30 years each at least and the industrial guys there all had to be less than three years and after they gave them the challenge test there was almost the industrial guys even moved away a little bit but you see there was this still this linear relationship of 24 hour challenge DMPS 300 milligrams it's a strong challenge versus the plasma inorganic mercury before the test so urine was linearly correlated with plasma before the test and the challenged urine was also linearly correlated it was just the scale goes up about tenfold higher and if you look at the challenged this is the pre-challenge urine and the post-challenge urine notice they're linearly correlated so if you have good enough tools to see the levels without a challenge look at them without a challenge because then we can compare how it is in the blood to the urine to see how well the kidneys are functioning so they just went on to say that it didn't really do what they thought it did. And though I think challenges are useful for making something easily visible in a fairly cheap test, they are misused because they're, you look at your results against unchallenged urine. So one guy who was doing DMPS challenges told me that he took a thousand doctors and he ran challenges on them and of those thousand you know how many were over the end of the scale you know off the chart like everybody tells me they're off the chart 950 so everybody's off the chart if you give them enough DMPS unless they have no exposure or if their kidney transport system isn't working and then they'll be artificially low the other problem with it is you're giving a really high dose of a chelator to someone who's probably already pretty sick. And so people get into problems with that. Some people tolerate it fine, but a lot of people get even sicker from it. So I'm going to discuss a little bit of mercury speciation testing where we're doing all ambient measures, very low detection limits, and we separate out the methyl and the inorganic mercury, and we do a combination of blood, hair, and urine. So again, this is to separate two, two major forms of mercury. And we don't really need to look at them because we got a lot of stuff to cover. So, remember we said in blood we have methyl and inorganic mercury. In hair we have all methyl mercury. So, we're going to compare the blood methyl mercury to the hair mercury. This is based on work that was done by Boyd Haley, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, where they saw that autistic kids, the more severe the autism, the lower the mercury in the hair for children of mothers who had significant mercury exposure. It was, a, it was a pretty good paper, it was pretty compelling data in it. And we've used that, we make scales between, uh, you know, of what the ratio of blood to hair should be and also what the ratio of blood to urine should be. So we said uh, blood has inorganic mercury, urine is all inorganic mercury, so we're gonna compare the blood inorganic mercury number to the urinary inorganic mercury number. And let's skip that and look at some of what it looks like. So uh, this is blood. There's methylmercury in blood, and those are percentiles of the population, 50th, 75th, 90th, 95th percentile. Inorganic mercury, here it is, 50th, 75th, 90th, 95th percentile. The blue is the patient. The gray is just an average bar for everybody who's gone through. Uh, and down here we have the ratio. So this is blood inorganic mercury. I apologize, these screens aren't too clear. And this is urinary inorganic. So blood inorganic mercury, that number there, versus urinary inorganic. As blood inorganic goes up, the urinary output should track linearly with it up. So as I expose you to more and more mercury, uh, because you have a, you know, you're removing a lot of amalgams or you have a lot of amalgams in your mouth, that number will go up and the urine will track it along that diagonal line. So here's a person whose urine to blood ratio is appropriate. It means as it's going in, it's going out.
out. Doesn't mean there won't be any damage, but it does mean that you can cycle this stuff out. The hair to blood ratio is the hair methylmercury, I mean, I'm sorry, the blood methylmercury number here on the x axis versus the hair on the y. And that diagonal line is uh, the ratio between what should be the ratio between them. So when this skews off, Sure, we have examples of this. Oh, well, here's the hair to blood ratio skewing off with a high methylmercury patient. This is more of a liver function indicator. Issues with sulfur cycling and liver function, you'll see this depressed more. Whereas this one over here is an obvious kidney indicator. Here you have very elevated inorganic mercury and the urine to blood ratio is very bad. Now in people we've seen with really bad, we've seen a couple of people with really bad urine to blood ratios, very high inorganic mercury in the blood, very low in the urine, and when they do challenge tests, their challenges are really low. One of my doctors in California showed me these challenge tests, DMPS challenges of four, that's really, really low. And then we looked at his blood and his blood was all the way up here in both forms. And so there he was getting an artificial negative there. Now this is probably the most important indicator. Like if we had to worry more about one form, it would be the, in, the inorganic mercury pool. And if we had to worry about one measure, it's the blood to urine measure. The blood to urine measure dictates more than anything else how rocky of a road the detox is going to be. And if you have bad urine to blood, you absolutely should not do the chelators. But even if you're going through a route of glutathione upregulation where you're focusing on the GI tract, you still have to go slower with it. Remember when I was talking this morning, I said detox consists of squeezing from the cells into circulation and filtering circulation. Even if we're trying to pull through the liver GI tract, when we squeeze into circulation, a bunch of that will hit the kidneys. Uh, here's just more of the same. You'll see different ratios with different people. I think there was some fish ones in here. Here was a guy, very high methylmercury. This is from Hawaii. Very high inorganic mercury. I would expect this the guy to be eating fish and have amalgams to get that much inorganic. We definitely see there's a blood to urine problem. There's retention. But this guy wasn't eating, uh, this guy didn't have amalgams at all. This was all from fish methylmercury demethylating into the inorganic mercury pool coupled to also getting retained at the kidney. Now recall, this is not new, this kidney retention. 1973, Hal Huggins' book, it's all in your head. He could measure urine and he didn't do challenges and he said, I got two guys here, they both got 20 amalgams. This guy has high urine mercury, this guy is low urine mercury, which one do you think is going to be the sick one? It's the guy with the low urinary mercury. And he dubbed it then retention toxicity. Al? Uh, can you measure other toxic metals such as lead with the same test? Yeah, well, so all the other metals we just do a blood number and it's going to take us a while to get the blood urine ratios that are appropriate until we can do this. You know, I had a PhD in this, I got a lab, I can do as many measurements as I want to get that stuff. And it was, you know, I used to go down to Huggins groups and I'd measure all of his people and get this stuff. Uh, but I haven't gotten that deep in with the other numbers, so we just use blood numbers for those. All right, so this guy's got a lot of demethylation of the fish-based mercury, and so we don't want him eating much fish. This guy has an even higher methylmercury number, but very much lower inorganic mercury, and he still has a little bit of retention, but it means he doesn't demethylate as much. Remember I said with the fish-eating birds, the ones that demethylated the most had the most brain lesions. And in fish, livers, the ones that demethylate the most, have the most lipofusin. 
But ofusin is an oxidative stress uh, product in the extracellular matrix and inorganic mercury produces a lot of it whereas methylmercury doesn't produce much at all. This is, that was another very good study that we got from uh, the environmental world that informed us about the problems that we face. A lot of people, metals in the liver cause a lot, a lot of damage. Uh, the only thing I really want to talk more about is other measurements. People come to me all the time, oh doc, can you test me and tell me if I'm toxic? I said, I got a better chance of telling you if you're toxic just standing here talking to you. Because toxicity is not a level. Toxicity is your body's response to the level. And you standing in front of me jerking and acting weird is a lot more clear than me giving you the levels. The levels are giving us a lot of guidance. If you're way up, you're probably toxic. If you're way down, you're not. In the middle, we have to get more information. But those ratios can tell us a lot about how much propensity you have to retain a lot of other toxins with that. Dr. Brownstein? So, so if this mercury is floating around for 100 days, I catch the red blood cells, where does it go when the red blood cells die around that time? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know enough about what happens to a red blood cell when it dies. If the proteins fall apart, they could get incorporated into something else. Maybe that's a time at which uh, it's recognized as being on there and uh, conjugated to mercury. Something we'll have to think about a little bit more. But it does have, I mean, it's got a very long lifetime. So toxicity is the response of the body to the mercury. It has to be diagnosed from a combination of clinical symptomology and any other auxiliary testing that you do. Uh, and then remember, sometimes we're talking about, I showed these slides before, sometimes we're talking about a previous exposure causing a dysfunction in the glutathione system. You know, when the people say, oh, it's from my mom's amalgams, it's from this exposure I had when I was a kid. Maybe, it, you know, often it's a number of other toxins falling into the same trap. When I spoke in Vancouver, I called this isomercuric syndrome, that some combination of transgenerational and early life insults to the body cause a weakness in the defense system, the glutathione system, resulting in a propensity to attract and retain other toxins that would be detoxified by the glutathione system. These would be isomercurics, things that are like mercury. So cadmium and arsenic, a number, uh, all the chlorinated hydrocarbons, things like Agent Orange, DDT, uh, all the cleaning chemicals, uh, the mold toxins, all these could fall into that trap. So when you're looking at their history, you're looking at when this might have happened that they opened up their doors to all these things. Uh, we also point people towards doing symptom surveys and IOMT has a nice online symptom survey that gives you a numerical res uh, result that you can write down but you can also email out to your doctor and you can do it before and after testing. It's iaomt.org slash symptom dash survey or slash SX survey. And with symptom surveys, they're, they're just looking, they're giving you a bunch of different questions related to possible w things that are associated with mercury. They're usually broken down into psychological and behavioral, cardiovascular, digestive, immune. And you're looking for enough things that add to a picture of mercury causing your deficits because it's really weak link in the chain. You know, whatever is weak in you is what's going to go. And so mercury toxicity can look like so many different things. As far as auxiliary testing, there are the hypersensitivity tests, MELISA and ELISA. Uh, MELISA is a very important one. There's porphyrins, glutathione levels, GST levels, uh, and all of the different uh, genomic SNPs. 
All right, so now let's talk quickly about uh, detoxification. And just remember, the feds are kind of gunning after chelation. So you do need some more naturopathic approaches to getting rid of metals. In the first talk, I talked about this uh, super system of enzymes that takes all of your antioxidants into their respective roles. And that's really what we're going to be after. And I'm going to have to do this real quick, but phytogenomics is certain phytochemicals upregulate phase two enzymes as well as intracellular antioxidants. And these are the things that we need. Remember I said we need glutathione, we need phase two enzymes, glutathione as transferase, and we need the transporters to take things out. And so the main games that bring up these uh, these reactions are polyphenolic antioxidants and sulfur compounds. So remember I said we thought of those as antioxidants, but it turns out there's actually free radical reactions that do that. And so a number of our pro-oxidants can do this as well. And so the mechanism here is called the NRF2 protein and it's stuck on the KEEP1 protein outside the cell and it gets moved inside the cell by certain enzyme inducers. And these enzyme inducers include polyphenolic antioxidants like green tea extract, like pomegranate extract. Uh, here's the one I use a lot of called Harataki or Terminalia Chebula. This blue hand here is the hand of the Medicine Buddha. The Medicine Buddha is uh, the Buddha of medicine in Tibet and uh, he holds a plant called Terminalia Chebula. Uh, Stephen Hubert over there is working on growing this in Hawaii so we have a nice green, nice clean source of it. If you remember I talked about that study with the young and the old mice and how they lost all of their robustness of their antioxidant enzymes. Well when they were treated with an aqueous suspension of the Harataki uh, all the numbers all the numbers in the old mice, the treated mice ended up with the same numbers as the young mice. So all of this disruption in the antioxidant enzyme system was returned to normal through this uh, very extensive polyphenolic solution from the Harataki. Uh, it's important to realize then that as we look deeper and deeper into all the work, Frank Schallenberger was here before me, and it turns out that reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species, reactive sulfur species can all hit this trigger in the same way that the polyphenols and the sulfur-based chemicals do. In fact, we use polyphenols more than the sulfur-based stuff like garlic and uh, sulforaphane from the crucifers because those seem to irritate, the sulfur compounds seem to irritate toxic people more. Well, they're also more potent at generating free radicals and making this reaction happen. And as I mentioned this morning, it looks like even DMPS and DMSA can catalyze some of this upregulation. The sulfur compounds, these are these, you know, a lot of people used to talk that the sulfur compounds were chelators because they're sulfur compounds. They are not chelators. Garlic is not a chelator. That's not a sulfhydryl. Uh, erucin, sulforaphane, these are isothiocyanates. They are not chelators. They're stimulators of the glutathione system, which is a chelator. One of the other issues with the, uh, with the sulfur compounds is molybdenum deficiency. You have to be able to cycle the sulfur out eventually into sulfate. When you're molybdenum deficient, you build up sulfite and have sulfite toxicity. So if anybody's having a problem with anything from, uh, from any of the crucifers, the garlic, uh, on into taking uh, glutathione directly, if they're having a problem with that, they usually need more molybdenum. Uh, I'm going to skip through that. This is about the free radical reactions uh, that happen to induce this. This is a paper on ozone and they found that ozone brings up glutathione. How does ozone bring up glutathione? By triggering NRF2 to translocate into the cell and, uh, and turn up that action. And these are just pictures of those, those pathways. 
uh, the NRF2 is inherent in protecting you against a number of different insults. This is a paper on dopamine neuron degeneration. This is Parkinson's they were uh, making happen in fish and if they turned down, they were using methylmercury and creating Parkinson's if they turned off the NRF2 mechanism. If you weren't able to turn on your glutathione chelation system, the little fish would get fish Parkinson's from methylmercury. Uh, and people ask how to detoxify the brain. Turns out all these enzymes, the phase one and phase two enzymes, these are capillaries along the blood brain barrier. In red there is phase two, in green is phase three, and in yellow is where they're co-located. Meaning that these enzymes are together at the capillaries, there is an efflux system for the brain. But what if that doesn't work? What if the NRF2 button is broken? What if you've got protein glutathione elation and the proteins are broken? There's a long thing, there's a number of things that can disrupt this hormetic response and one of the worst ones are mold toxins. This is ochratoxin. A review of evidence that ochratoxin is an NRF2 inhibitor. That's why so many people who are mold toxic are mercury toxic, cadmium toxic, arsenic toxic, everything toxic because their removal systems are broken. So when the removal systems are broken, we have to go in more directly. A lot of people say, well, why can't you just feed in precursors to glutathione? Because the glutathione synthesis system isn't working. This is, uh, and this is a word of warning if we're doing hyperbarics or ozone, if there is mold toxicity breaking that switch, you can't tolerate that hormetic shot of a pro-oxidant. So we might need to go with direct glutathione support to get rid of the mold first, such as IV glutathione, nebulized glutathione, transdermal, acetyl, and liposomal. You need some way to bring in the glutathione. We tend towards using liposomes because we like bringing in the phospholipids as well, which help rebuild the membranes. I'm almost done here and there's nothing scheduled after this, so just give me one minute. <laughs> She's, she does her job well. Uh, and just this was uh, some data where they looked at HIV patients and they were looking at uh, oxidized versus reduced glutathione. This is in the controls. You're supposed to be dominantly reduced and in HIV you become dominantly oxidized. And they took them and they exposed them to tuberculosis and they were trying to get an immune response out of them. And to get the proper immune response out of them, they had to normalize the oxidized to reduced glutathione inside the cells. And they tried using a liposomal glutathione and NAC and acetylcysteine, the precursor. NAC did work. The liposome worked. This is, you know, basically this is a fixed one, all gray, it's all reduced glutathione. It can now act as an, it can now send out the immune signals. And this is with the NAC. But they had to use a thousand times more an acetylcysteine to get it to work. So there's times where you've got a goose in with reduced straight glutathione, get that into the system, one of these different ways to try to rescue the system. There's also been some work done on it being able to go across membranes, liposomes going across membranes a hundred times more effectively than IV. So you've got a lot of different tools, they act a little bit differently, but uh, I'm a fan of the liposomes. Now, one of the best things I've found in research for, for this talk, this talk is actually one I gave uh, to an autism group, epigenetic model modification of the NRF2. Kill the NRF2, right? Say the mold does it, whatever does it. In prostate cancer, if you look in the prostate cancer cells, those mechanisms are turned off. How do they reverse that? They reverse that with diindolyl methane. DIM was able to reverse the shutoff on the NRF2. So that's a really, really important paper and I look forward to seeing other people uh, work with that. Uh, one more thing I want to tell you before we go is this about using plant-based compounds for turning on gene expression. This you've got to remember. 
What if the mechanisms are overworked? What do I mean by that? There's two things, and there was a slide before that talked about the first thing. Two things that are key to inducing genes. One is you have to get to a threshold dose that actually triggers the nuclear factor to turn on. And there was some data before where low doses of St. John's wort would not induce this gene, but high doses will. The second is that it's time limited, the response. It can't go on indefinitely. Can you turn up a mechanism threefold and just leave it up like that? Not many of them. So this is the St. John's wort. They went to the high dose. They induced, this is phase two and phase three detoxification. And then they did it for 30 days. And over 10 days, you go up, 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 up. You're 300% over baseline expression of the transport proteins. 300% over baseline of the conjugating proteins. And then if you keep taking it every day, you go up, 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 up. Day 30, you are no higher than you were on day one. That means you must pulse these things. We start with five days on, two days off, and we move them up to 10 days on, four days off. I was at a summit with Dietrich Klinghart, Lee Cowden, Gary Gordon, a couple other people who've been in the autism world for a long time, and we talked about this, and everybody came up with a story of some great teacher they knew who taught 10 days on, four days off. You have to reset the switch or it stops working. So, remember you need glutathione, you need to clear out the transport proteins, and I didn't talk about that aspect of it, but that's usually binding, binders, things that bind metals or other toxins in the GI tract, and there are a lot of different kind of binders. Chlorella's got specific metal binding capacity. Uh, thiolated resins like thiolated silicas have the most binding capacity. Uh, charcoal has very little Clays and zeolites are phenomenal for a number of pesticides, herbicides, a number of mold toxins, but have no metal binding capacity. So choose your binders well in the GI tract for transport. You use plant-based uh, chemistry or prooxidants to turn up phase two enzymes, and you're gonna bring in glutathione any number of ways. If you set up a detox like that, you will be successful, but start with low doses and slowly bring them up and pulse those doses a certain amount of days on, certain amount of days off. Best is 10 on, 4 off. So that's my 45 minute coverage of six hours of material. Talk to Phil Malika. We, we teach for eight, 10 hours at his school there. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sh Chris Shade. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. Uh, the AGD code for this afternoon is C as in Chris, S as in Shade, 149122.